Okay, there we go. Now we'll be okay. Daniel chapter 1, as I said before, we, we have an aspect that we want to look into here this morning. And if you look in Daniel chapter 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, remember, we looked at that in the book of Chronicles, didn't we? And we, we looked at that horrible statement where God said, I sent my servants and there is no remedy. And I brought my servant Nebuchadnezzar to Jerusalem. And you remember that he burned Jerusalem down. Uh, he sent centuries of judges and prophets and Israel would not hear. They would not hear. And so God uh, brought judgment to his own people, to his own place where his name was to be set, uh, and brought judgment. So, verse 2, we'll get back to that in a minute. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spoke to Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring a certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, you in whom was no blemish, well favored and skillful in all wisdom, gifted in knowledge, understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldean. Now understand that um, they have been taken captive. Daniel is a captive all the way through this book. Uh, he's taken as a slave. He's carried away. He's brought into the king's palace. His name would be changed. Um, he would be brought into the learning of the Chaldean. Uh, and the king appointed them the daily provision of the king's food, of, of the wine which he drank. So nourishing them three years, that at the end of them they might stand before the king. Now, among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Um, these names were names after their religion and their gods. So there was to be the uh, full uh, metamorphosis made of these men. Uh, they were to be used by um, Babylon. Um, and you might say they were to be Babylonized. <laughs> All right? Uh, and then we find that Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the king's Provisions. He's not going to do it. And we looked at that the last time we were together and to the other times uh, that there was confrontation. And we understand that this, this they represent the godly remnant. Like Elijah was told by God, there will be a remnant. Uh, always have a remnant. And we understand that by Romans chapter 11. Uh, that there is a remnant and the grace of God in a remnant, so the truth has place with God's people. All right. So understanding that, understanding the godliness of these men, uh, it was never their intentions to rebel or to protest, to change uh, any decrees or laws, uh, or to get uh, to get a right wing Christian political. Uh, nothing like that. That was not what was on their minds. Um, instead, it was that they were obedient to God's will and the word of God. Uh, and we looked at that in several examples of it, such as Daniel opening his windows toward Jerusalem. He had always done that. He just didn't quit doing it. Uh, he did that because Solomon said he was supposed to do it in the word of God. Uh, it was not, Daniel didn't say, well, I'll show old Darius, I'm, I've got an executive position in this kingdom, I'll do as I please. That was not Daniel's heart. Daniel, if you look at, read the book of Daniel, Daniel was a godly man. Uh, his mind was on godly things. 
he understood about the kingdom of God. Uh, that's where, and he was he was zeroed in on that. So even under the circumstances uh, that he had, I think that's an example for us. Uh, we need not be Americanized. Uh, we really ought to be more focused in living for God. And here comes David. Okay, and so, um, so we hi Dave. So we uh, are, are continuing our study with what has transpired here. So go back to verse 1 and 2, the carrying away. This is a definite demarcation dispensationally. This is the times of the Gentiles. Now I think I introduced the thought, and when you look at Daniel, he has um, lived through one kingdom, uh, was inducted into the other, and when our Lord speaks, that third kingdom, Rome, uh, is where our Lord speaks about what about this progression, and then of course is the fourth kingdom that will come on this earth, and that will be the kingdom of heaven, uh, the rock that is um, that is brought forth out of the mountain without hands. And that's that everlasting kingdom. So I hope you're reading the book of Daniel so you know what I'm talking about. So um, let's understand what's going on here. This, this taking, this judging Jerusalem is all a part of God's program. Um, when, and this theme, rise and fall of kingdoms, I don't think that's the theme of the book of Daniel. I disagree entirely with it. I'm going to say it's God's sovereignty in the kingdoms of men. And uh, because that's what we're told in, in the scriptures. Okay, the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men. And this is about God's kingdom, to be honest with you. Uh, it's a sovereign God ruling. And that's what this book's about. So I hope that we could appreciate that. Okay. Kind of like the book of Acts. It's not the Acts of the Apostles, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, the, the gifts are not what runs things. It's God that runs things. It's God that runs missions. Uh, the Holy Spirit's the agent in the church. Um, so it was not those specific apostles. All right. Now in Daniel, uh, let's look if you will please, and I, I want to, to try to broach two subjects here. Um, one is, of course, this times of the Gentile versus the fullness of the Gentile. They're two entirely different things. And I want to make sure that you know the distinction between the two. Okay? And then second is Babylon and that whole principle of Babylon. And we have to understand that if we're going to appreciate what's being done here by God through Daniel, in these kingdoms. Okay? All right, so look in the book of Luke, chapter 21. Luke, chapter 21. Luke, chapter 21. The question is, is brought by his disciples. Luke, chapter 21. Notice, if you will, please, Luke 21, verse 7. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And our Lord is speaking about the kingdom. All right, and he said, Take heed that, that she be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near, go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not at once. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in different places, and famines and pestilence and fearful sights and great signs shall be from heaven. Now you say, Pastor Ted... Isn't that going on in the world today? Uh, yes, but this will set a precedent and it will be constant. It's going to be far more severe 
in those days because these are signs to men. Okay? So yes, we're getting a little preview, I think, of the tribulation now. But when the Holy Spirit and church is taken out and the Holy Spirit is no longer there, remember we studied that in Thessalonians, um, then uh, evil and wickedness will come to a full and then God will judge it. Okay? But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up into the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Now we're studying that in the book of Acts, aren't we? where Paul was brought up before kings and he, he was persecuted for the name of Christ. And it shall turn to you for testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. All right, now I'm going to move along here. Look in verse 20. Our Lord has a foretelling. There's foretelling and foretelling. Um, remember, this is the prophet. When Jesus Christ came in his ministry, he fulfilled the Old Testament prediction of the prophet from Deuteronomy 18, right? And this is the prophet, and he is, and he is foretelling about Jerusalem here. All right, and when, they, when he shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies and know that its desolation is near... Now, I want you to notice, I don't believe we're talking about when Titus comes. I think Matthew is, and Mark is, but not Luke. Um, Luke says armies, plural, plural, armies, okay? I don't believe he's talking about Titus. There are two different besiegements that we see in the Gospels. This is the one where Christ is foretelling when the Antichrist will break his league with Israel and then there will be a confederacy that will move against Jerusalem and besiege it. Okay? Then let them who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let them who are in the midst of it depart and let not them that are in the countries enter into it. For these are the days of vengeance, and all things which are written may be fulfilled. All things, all things concerning what? Jerusalem, and the judgment, and the times of the Gentiles. That begins with Nebuchadnezzar coming in, destroying Jerusalem, and taking out uh, and redeploying, if you will, these folks, and Daniel was what? He was in the first deployment. Okay? Now, none of that is coincidence. This all goes together. And it would be Daniel who would be given the prophecy about the end times when God will bring judgment to the kingdoms of men and bring in his kingdom uh, at the end of the tribulation period of time. Are you seeing how this fits together? Um, there is more than what meets the eye <laughs> in the book of Daniel. Uh, you have to be up on and you have to be looking at the whole picture. It's a little bit like Acts, but kind of in, kind of in reverse in some senses. Um, there's, the, there's, this, there's this total picture from up here. And then there's these detailed things that are happening down here, and they all have different significance at the moment and for later. Did that make any sense? Was that clear as mud? <laughs> all right. So you, you got to keep the overview in mind why we're told what we're told in the book of Daniel. Remember the great rule of exposition? You mark not only what is said, but how it is said, to whom it is said, uh, how right, and, and under what circumstances, at what time, for what purpose. So when we're looking at this and we're told about King Jehoiakim, and we're told about Nebuchadnezzar coming, and um, we're, we're told about the Babylon and the, this, um, uh, this remnant of believers, and what is happening to them, and these the, the power of these kingdoms. 
Uh, you have to understand what's going on. Well, what is going on? Well, it's the times of the Gentiles has just began. The times of the Gentiles. And why did that happen? Because Israel wouldn't listen. They would not listen. And God has not done away with these, not cast away his people, as explained in Romans. But there is a postponement. There's a postponement. Uh, God is long-suffering. Uh, for almost a millennium, God sent judges and he sent even some uh, revivals with kings and sent the prophets. And then for 400 years, God didn't send anything. <laughs> right? They ain't listening. Uh, so when our Lord Jesus Christ came, uh, after 400 years of not hearing a word, you see, um, uh, then uh, the forerunner came as predicted in Scripture, John the Baptist, and the preaching of repentance to Israel concerning the what? Kingdom. What was the message? Repent, for the kingdom of God is what? At hand. Well, here he is teaching this, and still, where's Israel? Not listening. I would have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chicks under the wings, but she would not. I'm running out of time, it says. Um, so um, he said, now your house is left unto you what? Again, it's, it's the same cycle. That big, beautiful thing that Herod built, Titus comes in in 70 AD and just destroys it. Okay? Now, look, if you will, please, in Luke chapter 21, verse 23. But woe unto them that are with child, unto them that nurse children in those days. Does that sound familiar? It should. It, it, you're, you, you see the same thing written in Revelation. Uh, for there shall be great distress in the land. What land? In the land. What land is that? Jerusalem. I mean, Israel. Palestine. Yeah. Um, re remember when the land is mentioned in relation to Israel, it's that land of promise. And what was supposed to happen in that land? Blessing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it was to be a land of promise. Um, they were to thrive and flourish and be blessed in that land. Uh, but when you come to the Old Testament prophets and you see the land is polluted, uh, that doesn't mean somebody um, ran a ship into the shore and there was oil. Now, that's not the pollution we're talking about. That pollution was sin. You've polluted the land I've set apart. Um, and you've brought in the idols. You, you've lived like the nations. You've polluted the land. See? Um, so, the land, and that would refer to Israel. And wrath upon this people. What people? Who's the this people that Jesus is referring to? The Jews. The Jews. Please don't try to make this something it's not. I like what... Um, oh, okay, now. Uh, things to come. Uh, how can I forget his name? What can I cost? How could I forget that name? Pentecost. How could I forget that? Uh -huh. uh, Dwight Pentecost. And he said, always keep Israel, Israel, the church, the church, and the nations, the nations, and you'll do just fine with eschatology. Uh, when people try to cross over the church in with it, can't do it. You, you have to, uh, you'll do violence to scripture to do it. All right, we're talking about the land, Palestine. We're talking about this people. Israel. All right. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive to all what? Nations. Nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now I want to work on that a little bit. We want to understand these two besiegements, first of all. Um, there would be the besiegement that Jesus refers to. Go back to the book of Matthew for just, 
just a minute. Um, Matthew, I think I want Matthew 24, I'm pretty sure. Matthew, yes. Matthew, let's back up to chapter chapter 23, verse 37. Uh, you have to distinguish. Now, this is, uh, this, is what, this is tricky business sometimes. And I don't mean that in a deceptive way. What I'm saying is, you can have foretelling and foretelling in the same sentence. In the Old Testament, you, you've got to be, because sometimes a semicolon is the only thing that separates them. <laughs> All right, so this is forth telling here. Look in Matthew 23, verse 37. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them who are sent unto thee, how often I would have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. Oh, there's those terrible words. And ye would not. Stiff-necked, rebellious Israel, boy. You remember what Moses told Joshua? This is a rebellious people. <laughs> Stiff-necked, bull-headed, willful. <laughs> um, and, and still... Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. All oh, how they glorified the temple. He that swears by the temple. Remember that? Um, and notice, for he, I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now that's a time-oriented piece of scripture. All right, now verse 24. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Then the questions are asked. Now what besiegement is he talking about here? Titus, he's not talking about the besiegement in the future in the tribulation. Luke is. Luke is giving us that. Now, uh, people get confused. Oh, well, then the Gospels are, are contradicting each other. Of course not. Matthew is about the king of the kingdom. The kingdom of God. Luke was a Gentile disciple. And his job is to, sh is to show the humanity of Christ and he's representing the Gentile side of things and uh, remember that it would be Luke that would also write the book of what? Acts. Acts. So let's understand. I hope we can see the difference between the two. The Olivet Discourse had just been given um, and the, the, the city will be taken by enemies, but delivered by the return of the Lord. And that is what is important here when we're looking at this in Luke chapter 21, 27. Jesus Christ has a different description here. Do you see the difference in description? His description in Matthew is not one of these stones. He's pointing at Herod's temple. Not one of these stones will be left upon another. Don't try to make these the same thing. They are not the same. They're, they're far from the same thing. So when you're studying prophecy, and we're contemplating all this, by the way, um, understand that there is foretelling and forthtelling. Okay? Now, we're interested in this particular passage. Why? Because that time of the Gentiles trotting, tra treading underfoot Jerusalem started when Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel was part of that first deportation. Okay? All right. Now, um, and, and I may say that there is an application here that no matter how bad things may get, politically, spiritually, 
We're still to live godly for Jesus Christ. We are always in his kingdom. And we're to represent him and his kingdom. You say, well, Pastor Ted, where do you get that from? Well, look at God's purpose when he started out under the law, if you will. And that's why we studied about the kingdom first. You see, you've got to understand that. So look in the book of, of Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. And let's look, if you will, here uh, in verse 5. Now, therefore, Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then, if then, conditional, ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of what? A holy nation. God was in the business of making a difference. The nations were to look at Israel and see God. Okay? He says in Isaiah, he says, Ye were my witnesses. And the nations would dare be as wicked as you. <laughs> right? <laughs> Isaiah calls Judah and Israel Sodom and Gomorrah. You teach the nations how to sin. I would that someone would shut the gates. Okay, I need you to help out. I need you to shut the gates. I wish somebody had enough sense to shut the doors, not bring your sacrifices, your feasts, oh. your new moons. Don't panic. Um, I'm not panicking. No are panicking. You, That's panicking? good. Not I. That's not, that's not, not good. No, it isn't. All right, so now if you'll look back and if you'll look back here. So when they pop up, you can. Okay. Hit them. I'll get them. Got to kind of chase those babies, don't you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right, now we hit this deal and we get them all. Yeah. All right, we're all back. Good. Now, let's go back, if you will, please, to the book of uh, Luke, Luke chapter 21. And now we understand uh, the point that Jesus is making here in Luke. And we appreciate these two besiegements. I hope you can tell the difference between the two. Uh, they would be, uh, and there are some people who get into some way out dispensationalism and they twist it into the same thing and they try to say, well, what Titus did is what Jesus was saying, so that's, that's all over with. Well, no, of course it is not. Um, uh, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, uh, and that does not happen until later. So when we're talking about these armies... Uh, the sign is the abomination of desolation in the holy place. And if you look with me in the book of Revelation chapter 13, the book of Revelation chapter 13, um, remember that, uh, well, we better back up a little bit. The book of Revelation, uh, let's look in chapter 6 for a second. Chapter 6 first, we have the Antichrist coming on the scene in the tribulation period of time. We're now looking at the things that shall be hereafter in the book of, Hebrew, in the book of Revelation. And um, now I saw when the Lamb opened up one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder of one of the four living creatures saying, Come! And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Uh, this is not Christ. Uh, one of Satan's great uh, weapons is mimicry. Later on our Lord will come on a white horse, but he's not going to come for, for like, this, like this one comes. This is the Antichrist. 
Now, look with me, if you will, in chapter 13. We have some insets that go on. Um, And chapter 13, verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Now, there's some eschatological language here. A sea. You've heard the expression, a sea of people. Have you ever heard of that expression? Okay, the sea is the multitudes of the nations. So out of the multitude of the nations, I saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now mark this, because this is going to interrelate. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard. That would be the Chaldeans. Uh, That's what was on their panoplies, their flags, a leopard. Uh, And were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like that of a lion. Uh, And when you get into the lion, you get into uh, that second kingdom, uh, and that being uh, the Medes and the Medes and Persians. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Now, uh, you can see that this, this beast is over the what? The nations. That's the Antichrist. The dragon is Satan. Now, I happen to believe that Satan incarnates the Antichrist, but there are those that would disagree with me. But I think that's a little hard to do when you get into these next few verses. Um, And I saw one of his heads as though it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. That's the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire is going to be resurrected. Now, I want, as you're thinking about that, I want you to think about what the Jews said rejecting Jesus. Do you remember what they said? Your blood be on us and our children. Well, that was part two. Yeah. We have no, no, king. no king but who? Caesar. And they're going to get Caesar. Mm-hmm. Afraid so. They're going to have to live with that rejection. And notice, and they worshiped the dragon who gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? And who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Now, when we studied Thessalonians, we find that all over both Old and New Testament prophecy, and that is the number one thing that they share in characterizing the Antichrist. Speaking blasphemies, that mouth running uh, against, against Jesus Christ and against his saints. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. Mark that. That will end the time of the Gentile, the times of the Gentiles. Because after those months, Jesus Christ comes to the earth. We'll have that battle of Armageddon. And Jesus Christ will bring in his kingdom. And Jerusalem will be rebuilt again. And that and on the earth by him. And he's going to rule from there. The whole earth. Okay? So understanding this period that is de- that's a demarcation in scripture. The times of the Gentiles. Our Lord refers to it. And in reference to what Daniel had prophesied. Um, and notice, and he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues or languages and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are, are not written in the Lamb, book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. He, that, If any man have an ear, let him hear. And he leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience or perseverance and the faith of the saints. 
Then we're introduced to beast number two. That's the false prophet. And with the false prophet comes what? This is the political part. The religious part. Uh, Satan is a religious guy. Did you know that? Satan's religion has always been out there. And the bottom line of it is what we have in the garden. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Ye shall be as gods. And um, so when we look at this, my friends, and you read this, uh, you should read the rest of this section, uh, then what else do we have? Well, along with uh, underneath the spiritual, interestingly, is economical. And we get into that number, 666. There will be those that will have the mark of the beast. And they'll be able to trade, buy, and sell. And those who don't have it won't have that ability. They'll be persecuted. That 42 months, that ends the times of the Gentiles. Okay? Um, we're talking about Babylon. I know I don't have enough time for this. It's too bad too, isn't it? Look in chapter uh, 16, if you will. Uh, Babylon is going to be the center of things. Now, I'm going to refer to the book of Genesis chapter 11. What happened in Genesis 11? The Tower of Babel. Babel or Babel. And you remember that God said, go out and multiply throughout the earth. And what did they do? They, they decided <laughs> they were going to build a tower to heaven. And uh, the Trinity got together and said, no, nah, we're not going to have this. And so that's where languages came from. Okay? And believe me, you're not going to build anything if you can't understand the other guy. That's going to be a real frustrating day. Okay? Um, so um, that, that's the beginning of Babylon. Babel. The height of its power was during Daniel's time. And you can see why Habakkuk said, how can you take such a wicked people and judge Israel? Uh, You're a holy God. Surely you have more holy eyes than to behold this. Now I'm going to sit on my tower and see what you've got to say. And God let him know that just live by faith. I have plenty to say. And here's my program, Habakkuk. Not that I owe you an explanation, but I'm going to give you one. Here's what Israel has done. You have six woes in chapter 2. And, uh, and then we have Habakkuk praising God in chapter 3. Uh, and God said, you know what? These Chaldeans, I'm going to deal with them too. Okay? So understand. Now look in chapter 16. And the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying... It is done. Uh Uh-oh. Something's going to get judged, isn't it? It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was, was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations, catch that, the cities of who? The nations, the nations. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Why? Because the times of the Gentiles are going to end. Babylon will be the center. Babylon will be the center. And where's Babylon located? Not too many miles from Israel. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. What's the present day Babylon? It's Iraq. Mm -hmm. Ain't that interesting? All right. Now notice. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of the talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague was exceedingly great. What's what's happening here? Babylon's being overthrown. And it has a very complex system. 
Uh, it has an ecclesiastical system, a political system, an economical system. And God is going to overthrow Babylon. And what's the nature of Babylon? Well, wickedness and gratifying every lust of man. And people are going to praise Babylon. Babylon's going to be the place to be, okay, uh, until God judges it. Until God judges it. Um, and you say, well, Pastor Ted, I, this book of Revelation is so complex. No, what is, what's happening is God is allowing sin to come to a full, and then he's going to judge it so everyone understands. You see, there will be no mistake when God gets done here. Where's Daniel deported to? Babylon. And where does, da where does God give prophecy to Daniel? In Babylon. In Babylon. And what is the prophecy that's given? The stone cut out of the mountains without hands is going to bring an everlasting kingdom. Mm -hmm. You see. Uh, do you think it was some sort of mistake that God has this godly man where he's at in Babylon? No mistake. <laughs> no mistake. Um, and I think this, this is so appropriate for us today. Um, and uh, with, with the movements of the day, we see men are getting more wicked and more wicked, aren't they? Uh, I think uh, I, I heard, now I didn't see it for myself, this is hearsay, but a lot of my writers, see, I get all my news from the writers. <laughs> so, uh, and some of my writers, the more conservative Trump group, uh, in my vehicle, said, well, there are people that if Trump wins, people are threatening violence. And I thought, well, what good's that going to do? I mean, he's still going to be president anyway. Um, but you, you, you can see how man becomes more corrupt and more corrupt and rebels against authority. You, you catch that? Um, and you can see how that sin comes to a full. You can see how the worldly systems are coming together to be run from one place, from one person even. See, there's going to be a one world government. We're moving that way, aren't we? We see the nations moving that way. Uh, we, we've seen now the euro, euro the euro's kind of failing, but we see a, an attempt to have a one monetary system. Right? Uh, my bank's still trying to get me to bank through my devices, and I won't do it because the FDIC does not insure that, just so you know that. That's, that's free. That's free advice to you. So if you pay your bills online or you do your banking online and somebody hacks it and you go to the bank, they're going to say, sorry, Charlie. I hope you know that. They aren't going to help you. <clears throat> So, but I know it's convenient, and I know some of you like it, but just understand now, I was a guard at a bank. I watched that happen at least once a month. Okay, but you can see how universal these devices are and the computer systems and how all of that can, is in what they call the cloud uh, and cyberspace. You can see uh, all of that economy. You can see a one-world economy. Uh, you can see the way the world is going, can you not? Mm -hmm. See? And men are foolish enough to trust it, and praise it, and live for it. Right? Uh, and understand that in Daniel's day, man, Babylon was the place. The, the huge walls, the hanging guard, I mean, it was magnificent. It was a magnificent place. Empire, powerful. Uh, so was the Roman Empire at one point. And Christians had to live in these empires. And my friends, we're expected to live today for the Lord as godly people. And I understand the things that are going on. Uh, it really troubles me when I see Christians get all worked up with politicians and they write these politicians and they give money to political parties. and all. What do you think you're doing? 
Can you not see from these apocryphal writings where this is going? That's about the poorest investment you can make. You better invest your time and your resources in the kingdom of God. That's the one that's going to last forever. Kingdoms will rise. He'll bring them up and he'll take them down. Understand? <laughs> it's going to be his kingdom that, that goes on forever. Let me read that. I, I wish you need to read chapter 17 and 18 about the great judgment and fall of Babylon. We'll have to... Uh, oh boy, we still didn't get to it. Um, but we'll, we'll look at that next time we're together. But go back to the book of Daniel, if you will. Go back to the book of Daniel. Um, you remember when Peter stood in front of the Sanhedrin. This is the stone which you builders have rejected that has now become the head of the coroner. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know about you and I, but for me, I wouldn't want that assignment. That is, a, that is a horseshoe full of people who didn't think twice about murdering Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I think they were there to make short work of Peter, John, and this, and this impotent man. I really do. I think their intentions were to off them. Okay? Uh, and I want you to notice that, you know, we ought to obey God, not men. Sorry to disappoint you there, Sanhedrin, but... We're not working for you. We're working for the resurrected one. Uh, No, we can't shut up. We're his witnesses. Sorry. Uh, And, uh, you know, now there was a time, though, then when Peter really failed to witness, didn't he? A little maid by a fire, down went Peter. The prison unto death, I'll follow you. Yeah, I can't get past the little maid by a fire, Peter. Gee whiz. (laughs) Then we see a different Peter, Right? Uh, imagine Daniel in his position, captive from Israel, uh, brought in before this powerful king um, and this very powerful nation. And look with me, if you will, please, uh, in the book of Daniel, if you will, please. And let's take a look at that. Um, let's take a look at that um, interpretation we're going to get. And let me see if I can find that chapter now. Not awful. Um, let's look in chapter 2 and verse 44. And he talks about these kingdoms. One after the other after the other. And even predicts the Roman Empire. Uh, the feet of clay and, and iron and so forth. And notice in verse 44, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. I wish more Christians would read these words and understand what Daniel was trying to tell us. That's you and I. We're in that kingdom. We're his remnant. And this is a time to stand. We need to represent the kingdom that stands forever. And notice, For as much as thou sawest the stone which was cut out of the mountain without hands. Again, ecclesiastical language. Mountains represent kingdoms. Okay, And it broke in pieces the iron and the bronze, the clay, silver, the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain. And the interpretation is what? It is certain. That's why I don't like when people, uncertain times. No, no, no. That's not what I read. There's no uncertain times. The Ancient of Days has mapped it all out for you. Okay? Understand where this world's heading. Understand its kingdoms will rise and fall and fail. But not this kingdom that stands forever. 
and it is centered around the rock that is cut out of the mountain without hands. So I hope that we can appreciate that. We'll look at Babylon the Great later in the fullness of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles is when Jesus Christ is calling out the church from the nations, the Gentile nations. That's the fullness of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles is what we just explained. So I I hope you can know the difference between those two. Because we are involved with both. Right now, at the center is the what? Fullness of the Gentiles. Where God is calling a people out of every tongue, out of every nation, uh, from everywhere. A people that are redeemed for His own. And that's the business of who? The church. That's the business of the church. Mm -hmm. And that's our place in the kingdom. That's our place in the kingdom. Okay. Let's end with a word of prayer.